Good morning, everyone. I wonder, when are you willing to give up your rights? There's a place in my house where I am very loath to give up what I believe to be my rights. It's mine, my own. Uh, everyone else has their own, and I think that it is my right to use this place whenever I want. It is my side of the bed. Now, there are times when uh, other people in my family might decide that they want that side of the bed instead. They might think they have a particular claim over it. There are even times when I, out of love or possibly even frustration, might give up my rights to what I think should be mine. And then there are other times when I stubbornly decide, no, I'm going to exercise my rights to what I think is my space. You might have uh, ended up in similar situations yourself, or you might be able to remember back to a time uh, when you were a child, when you were very, uh, very willing to try and take away someone else's rights to what they thought was their, their space, their place in the house. So when is it loving to give up our own rights for the sake of someone else? When, as Christians, should we do that for one another? As a Christian, from today's passage, we'll see that it is right for us to give up our rights out of love for one another. We're going through uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and this next section of the letter, chapters 8 to 14, focuses on the big issue that they had of idolatry, an issue that we still have today, even though it often looks very, very different. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he starts off by talking about how they know God, what a wonderful thing that is, what great knowledge they have. And it's true, what greater knowledge could we have than knowing God? But if we know God, do we truly love God? And if we truly love God, do we truly love the ones that he loves as well? Because further on in today's passage, we're going to see that the God we know and we love, he doesn't want us to just stand on our own rights, on our own knowledge, be puffed up by it. He wants us to consider that if we truly love him, will we love the people he loves and do what is necessary, even giving up our own rights to be able to do what is loving for them? Will we be caring for one another's consciences as Paul encourages the Corinthians to in this passage? So we know an amazing amount about God, don't we? Not because of how great we are, but because he reveals himself to us in the Bible. We know God, but as verse 1 in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 there says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. It's like the difference between a, a hot air balloon and a solid structure with firm foundations. Which one is going to weather a storm better? Which one would you rather be in when uh, a cyclone comes along. But verse 3 says, whoever loves God is known by God. So knowing God isn't, isn't enough. Knowing about God isn't enough. Knowing him so that we love him and know his love for us and therefore want to act on that, that's what really matters. And that's what Paul focuses on for the rest of this passage. Knowing God and loving him helps us weather the storm. And so, we come now to the issue at hand, food being sacrificed to idols. One of the big issues that the Corinthian church was struggling with at that time. Paul says there in verse 4, So then, about food, eating food, sacrificed idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. You see, food sacrificed to idols back in those days was pretty much all the meat that people could buy. Most meat sold in the town marketplace came from a sacrificial animal that had been slaughtered in a pagan temple ceremony. 
To find other meat, you've pretty much had to go out and uh, kill it yourself. But idolatry here isn't simply taking part in, in eating meat that had been, take, had been sacrificed this way. Idolatry is taking something good that God has given us and thinking that it will quench a thirst that only he can satisfy through Jesus. It's looking at something created as though it's going to deliver us rather than looking to the creator himself. So there are two important things here uh, in these verses that Paul wants the Corinthians to remember. First of all, an idol really is nothing. There's nothing behind it. Nothing there that you need to worry about. And secondly, there really is one, only one God. So you're not going to accidentally have your prayers listened to by another because no other exists. So, this is wonderful knowledge to have. It's powerful knowledge to have as well. He goes on, there's even more we can know about God. He says that there is one God, the Father. In verse 6, the first part he says, For us there is one God, the Father through him, through whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. This is no small thing to know. If we really believe that, that these two statements are true, then what greater thing is there to know? And of course, there is infinitely more for us to know about the world, but it all flows from these two statements, doesn't it? One Father, from whom all things came, and one Lord Jesus, through whom all things came. What a God to know he really is. And what a God to know that he loves us so as well. And so as a result, if you love God, do you love the people he loves? Not the strong, the mighty, those who will benefit us in some way, militarily, um, financially, materially, but loving people, even with frail consciences. Verse 7, Paul writes, But not everyone possesses this knowledge, the knowledge of, of who God is, of what really is behind the uh, temple sacrifices and the fact that those idols are nothing. Not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. That's what Paul says there in verse 7. Love must therefore limit freedom. Now, we're not just talking about someone who is offended by your actions, but someone who is tempted to go against their own conscience because of your actions. Conscience is a funny thing, isn't it? I grew up thinking, for some reason, that anchovies were intrinsically wrong. It turns out that they're not. They actually work quite well when you add just the right amount to certain dishes. I grew up thinking they were intrinsically wrong because my dad had taught me to always leave them out, to think that they tasted terrible. It turns out they're not wrong. It's just that he didn't like them. Lots of people have very strong opinions when it comes to food, when it comes to lots of things that we take part in and lots of things that we do. Now, eating meat offered to idols is not intrinsically wrong, but violating your conscience is wrong, or doing something that causes someone else to violate, violate theirs, because a person, person's conscience is delicate and can easily be damaged or hardened. If we go against our conscience when we think that what we're doing is wrong, even if it's not intrinsically wrong, then it's going to be easier for us to go against it again when something really is wrong in every situation and for all people. So how do we determine where are these grey areas in the Christian life? Wouldn't it just be easier to permit everything and say, look, Christians are free to do whatever they want, or to ban everything and say uh, that Christians need to just stick to these very strict set of rules? It wouldn't be easy, but it would be simple, wouldn't it? Well, 
This isn't the way that Paul encourages the Corinthians to go. Because if everything is permitted, then, well, then we become indistinguishable from the culture around us. And Jesus wants us to be different, to stand out. And if everything is banned, then we end up cutting ourselves off from that same culture. And so Paul instead is trying here to find a balance to determine how they should approach the grey areas in life. Those things that aren't inherently good or inherently bad in and of themselves, in all situations and for all people. Paul says there in verse 8, Food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. It's morally neutral. It's a grey area. No advantage in eating it and no disadvantage in avoiding it. But even though eating food often to an idol is morally neutral, bowing down to that idol is not. And Paul wants the Corinthians to know that. He touches on that more in chapter 10. Even though, like he said, the idol is nothing, worshipping it, worshipping that idol is not nothing. Even though there's nothing behind it. Worshipping the idol, well, it's not going to build up the idol, is it? The idol is nothing, but it will tear down the one who is bowing down. There's an old saying uh, that lots of people like to use, that everything should be done in moderation. I actually think this is pretty dumb advice. There are some things that you should do lots of, such as drinking water, such as exercise, some things that you should not do at all. In fact, I prefer this version of the saying, uh, which I think is attributed to Oscar Wilde. Everything in moderation, including moderation. There is no place for moderation for things that are always sinful and always harmful. Stealing, lying, pornography, drugs, uh, certain, certain narcotics which are instantly going to be addictive. People may say that just a little bit of these things isn't really going to hurt you. But to avoid them, like we should, we need help from God and from each other. And so therefore, verses 9 to 13, show us how we can care for one another's consciences. How can we do this? Well, first, by doing what builds one another up, not just what is permissible. Verse 9, Paul says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For example, if you're right as a child to decide where you are going to put things in your room, how you are going to spread things on the floor of your room, if these things become a literal stumbling block to anyone brave enough to enter that room, and then they trip over and sprain their ankle, then just maybe you should consider giving up those rights for the sake of others. Paul says in verse 10, If someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? When talk, Paul talks about people being emboldened here, we might think, well, doesn't Paul want people to be bold? Well, not if it's being bold to sin. He wants them to be bold, to be built up in Christ, not built up into a habit of defying Christ. So just because something is permissible doesn't mean it's helpful or that it's going to build people up. We need to love one another more than our own rights. Because this is what happens if this brother with a brother or sister with a fragile conscience does something they think they shouldn't do. Verse 11, Paul says, This brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. And you can't say here that it was nothing to do with you, that they acted of their own free will, that you didn't make them do anything, because God knows our hearts. 
Verse 12 says, when you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So, since Jesus identified with us and died with us, including the weakest among us, and really aren't we all weak when we need Christ? Like Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, at just the right time while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So, when we destroy those whom Christ died to save, we're sinning against him. And so how does Paul feel about the prospect of doing this? We see in verse 13, he says, Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, Paul does not specifically tell us how we're going to decide which actions will injure a a fellow believer's spiritual life. Instead, he believes that we should have a life driven by the love of Christ that's going to produce in us the kind of attitude and the kind of sensitivity towards each other that will prevent us from hurting one another from encouraging one another to do harmful things. And we need to remember we're not talking about things here that we know are inherently good and we should be doing them, such as prayer, such as meeting together, reading God's word, or things that are inherently bad, sinful, and are going to hurt us. We're talking about the grey areas of the Christian life. For example, alcohol. It's not good, it's not always bad, but if it leads to drunkenness or encourages someone who has a problem with alcohol to drink too much, then it's something we can choose to avoid. Different types of food. A huge topic, even today. What food, how much food, how expensive the food is, where the food is sourced from whether to eat much meat, uh, whether to eat meat at all, whether to eat any animal products. Christians need to have discussions about this with each other, knowing that there is freedom, that there is no compulsion on either side, and above all, to know that there is grace. What about relationships and how they should be conducted? Particularly relationships between Christians prior to marriage. What is helpful for one person isn't necessarily going to be helpful for someone else. Whether people should kiss, whether people hold hands, whether people spend time alone together. These issues need wisdom and they need communication as well. What about how to approach approach the particular rules and conventions of other religions? For example, if a Christian woman decided to wear a headscarf when visiting a mosque. You might decide to do this out of respect, but then another Christian seeing it or hearing about it might think that this means you believe that Muslim beliefs align with Christian ones. And the answer here, well, it's to think about your context, to think about the situation, and always to be ready to communicate what your fears are, worries are, or what why you are choosing to do what you're doing. What about the use of uh, particular meditation practices by Christians? Ones that might have their roots in other religions. You might find them helpful, but someone else might think that therefore you are adhering to everything that that uh, meditation practice might come along with. Again, communication is important. Things like yoga. Some Christians decide that it's helpful. Some people would say that they would never take part in it. What about what you should or should not do on a Sunday? What about gambling? So often it's destructive and something you shouldn't take part in at all. But is buying a ticket in a raffle for a good cause on the same spectrum or not? Again, Christians might have different perspectives on this. And 
that's okay. Because, like I said at the beginning, as a Christian, it's okay to give up your rights out of love for one another. We need to be prepared to give up our rights out of love. Because we follow a Saviour and Lord who gave up his rights for us more than we could ever know. Like it says in in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And then in verse 8, being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be um, careful that by exercising our rights, we don't create a stumbling block for anyone. Help us to have wisdom to know what is good and what is helpful. Help us to always act out of love and compassion, seeking to build one another up in Christ, who died for us, who reigns with you, and through whom we pray. Amen.